one. Hey, Carrie, how's it going? Good morning, Brian. I'm well. How are you? Doing my best, which is pretty much my mantra for every day, because it kind of allows me to work with whatever I got. Absolutely. Now, we, our, our history is kind of proximity more than anything. Because yeah. I think I was coming into high school when you were in your senior year. So okay. I remember seeing you around the halls. And um, that was it. So, you know, I <laughs> I knew who you were from afar. And then at some point, I came across you on Facebook and was completely blown away by the work you were doing. Well, thank you so, so much. I knew we had to connect. And we've done a Zoom once before. And... I just had to connect with you again to kind of get the story. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, your um, content online and the work that you're doing always just really resonates with me. I just hit that like button really quickly. I think we have a similar just view regarding using our life and using our work um, just to manifest good things in the world. And I'm, I'm always drawn to your content as well. So, you know, too bad we weren't closer in Asian high school. <laughs> I was just going to say that I'm inspired by your example or Thank you. Connect that I've been inspired by that because anybody that's taking action to that degree and is actually doing something to solve the problem as opposed to giving it lip service, those are the folks that always get my attention. The oh, thank you. Thing. I was, I was raised um, in an Irish family and, you know, there's so much in the, just in front of our faces right now regarding immigration, I had four immigrant grandparents and they continually said, you know, put some verbs in your sentences. What will you do about that? It wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of whining or complaining in the culture of our family. It was, um, what should you do about that? What are you doing about that? What did you do? What did you contribute to that? And I think that's a pretty decent way to live. That's a darn good way of just getting to the bottom line. Put some verbs <laughs> in your sentences. Yes. <laughs> that is so awesome. Thank you. When I write, I remember hearing this. Uh, I don't know, are you familiar with Joan Didion? Yes. Remember, she was talking about one of her early jobs in, in writing, and the editor kept saying, action verbs, people, action verbs, action verbs. Yes. And, and I remembered that because I wasn't doing a lot of that in my own writing. And that really changed how I approached it. Because they had to think, hmm, if I talk about how they can take action and I'm not doing it, kind of making me be a bit of a hypocrite. So I've got to either take this action and report back, or I got to stick with the stuff that I've done, as yeah. opposed to talking about stuff that I'm going to do, hope to do, might do, but yeah. haven't done. Yeah. What are you doing, you know, just today for yourself? And, you know, we have to put ourselves on that list. It's not only what are we doing for others, but what are we doing for ourselves? What are we, um, how are we shaping our thoughts? How are we responding to things? Uh, it's very, um, just an active approach as opposed to sitting back and um, sitting, like stewing in our feelings. And I'm all for feeling our feelings and for processing things. But if we stay in our feelings, um, that can really take us down a rabbit hole in my view anyway. Absolutely. It's, it's the difference between surfing it and drowning in it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the wallowing and all that is just making sure you stay wet. Yeah, for but sure. That's you... a that's a great expression. My mother um, used to, you know, we, if I'm one of four girls, and if we were, you know, just upset or crying about something, she would allow our feelings, you know, and say, let it out, let it out, you know, and support us emotionally. But at the same time, you know, she would say, okay, okay, now now, now let's move forward. Now let's let's. Uh, take a step forward and, and do something else. We cannot sit in the stew much this longer. Was your mom? <laughs> yeah, it was my mother. Yeah. My mother had a pretty uh, difficult life and um, she is my inspiration. She sounds pretty emotionally intelligent. Yeah. And she really had no right to be because her upbringing was really difficult. She had a lot of trauma and difficulty um, in her life uh, without a lot of role models or examples or nurturing. And she was just a fantastic human being. She worked as a social worker um, 
at the DuPage Convalescent Center. And so we were raised, you know, as soon as we could walk and help, we were helping to feed residents. Um, sometimes she would need to take us to work. So helping to feed residents, um, pushing wheelchairs at the zoo, um, things like that. Just she really believed in serving others and using your life for the betterment of other people, probably to the extreme. I don't think she served herself enough. You know, I think self-care might have been missing for her, but you yeah. know, we just, we take what, we take the examples and we try to just take that a step further and just do a little bit better. Um, but yeah, she was a great um, role model and example. And then, you know, I had my youngest son then in my very early thirties and he has developmental disabilities. He's nonverbal, hearing impaired, has a mitochondrial disorder, and he is a light and a joy. Um, but it's a difficult journey. And it's interesting when you look back on your life and think, oh, I, I have been um, I have been being prepared for this in some way. And it's a, it's a choice every day if you will step into your preparedness um, or, or if you won't, you know. So I feel it's a lot of my adult choices and avocations have been really influenced by being um, Max's mom. You know, I'm, I'm Riley's mom too, but, you know, by being uh, Max's mom and being in that special needs community, it really uh, molds who you are, don't you think? Oh, my goodness. And something I want to piggy piggyback on about what you said about your mom, that she didn't have a, a right to be. Well, the thing is, she did have a right to be. What she didn't have was instruction. Yeah. She didn't yeah. have good role models because my upbringing was a mess. My parents were all over the place emotionally. I grew yeah. up being afraid all the time. But when mm -hmm. I discovered that, yeah, I do have a right to this. I just yeah. got to learn how. I got to do the healing. So yeah, yeah. I think I think what I meant was tremendous. that it was very um, one one would have really understood if she had been not very emotionally intelligent, you know. But her trauma informed a lot of empathy for her, um, and you don't have to have trauma to have empathy. But um, it's it's um, it's something to witness, you know, and and those you love that that um, you really can wring a lot of positivity you can ring a lot of understanding and compassion from truly terrible things you know absolutely one metaphor that i go back to over and over again is that there's two sides to every coin you know for all suffering there's healing you know yeah. for all anger there's joy and you know whatever the opposites are and since they're fundamentally connected it's a matter of just learning how to work from one extreme to the other how to do that yeah. in their work because they're connected. They're not a universe apart. And True. the more people understand that, then it's just a matter of digging in and doing True. that hard work, even if it means repeated ugly cries until you get through that pain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing that I want to really get into here is your work with the horses. Sure. So sure. that's one of the um, first I... things I saw you online, taking people out on the trails and then learning who you help. Yeah, you know, um, I've more. always been an animal person. We always were raised, you know, our pets in our home were members of our family. I, we had a little miniature schnauzer. I remember sobbing away to that dog. <laughs> just whatever minor or major thing was going on, um, they just have always been very um calming to me and it's a source of fun and joy and um i my degree in college is parks and rec administration and my sequence is therapeutic recreation so combining yeah. those two joys of you know helping people meet their goals and their aspirations in their life through recreation and leisure was always a horse girl my mommy never bought me a pony so it was always very privileged it was a very very special magical thing for me to ever be around horses. I didn't own my own horse until I was in my thirties. Um, so I became certified as a, as a therapeutic riding instructor when my son Max was, he was around eight and he was doing some riding and I was seeing how powerful it was for him. Um, and so I became certified and I worked at another center and then I started my own center in 2012 called Horsepower Therapeutic Riding and ran that for a decade. It was truly my entire personality. <laughs> Once horse about therapeutic riding, but you know, assisting people with all types of disabilities, veterans, trauma survivors, 
uh, little kids um, in foster care, kids of any age with Down syndrome, hearing impairment, vision impairment. I've taught blind people to ride. I have taught um, women who have are in rehabilitation from being sex trafficked um, how to ride and how to find their voice, how to find some joy. You know, horses are not mini bikes. They don't go where you tell them unless there is a degree of confidence, a degree of assertiveness, a degree of just knowledge of how physically to do it, but also an emotional connectedness. And, you know, you and I can both ride the same horse and have a very different experience um, based on what the horse knows about us. And it's a really powerful conduit for growth, for manifesting growth and change in people, whether it's their fine motor skills, whether it's their core strength, or whether it's seeing themselves in a new light. You know, when Max was a little kid, nothing made him feel more capable. Nothing made him feel more engaged than just riding a horse from point A to point B. You know, the kid fell all the time until he was about 10 years old. He walked with a walker um, until about first grade. Um, movement is not easy for him, has never been easy for him. And uh, he felt so empowered. And I was so just inspired by that. So yeah, so I started a nonprofit. Um, and then, of course, in keeping with with just my life and how you you have to pivot, you have to change. We well, don't have to, but I choose to. I choose to pivot. I choose to change. I choose to choose to, you know, change life up as needed. And so, two and a half years ago, I did retire from my own nonprofit when Max aged out of public school. So we are now volunteers at Horsepower, and it's very um, just rewarding to see that the work goes on. You know that organization wasn't about me it was about the mission and i had a hundred volunteers a dozen staff members you know they are continuing that mission without me at the helm and it's bittersweet and rewarding and i'm so proud of i'm proud of what i accomplished i'm proud of what they are accomplishing and you know it, it lives on it goes on there's a huge foster program they continue with the uh, sex trafficking rehab program as well as the myriad of the whole lifespan, any kind of disability that you can think of. We've, we've had um, transgender riders. You know, we had a transgender rider who for the first time in his life had gone longer than six months without trying to kill himself. Wow. And that's because he found community. You know, it's not so much. I mean, the horses are, of course, they are magical and they are amazing, but it's really about community. And we can apply that to our own lives wherever we go. You know, how can we build community for those around us who suffer, for those around us who ache for friendship, for skills, for being needed? It's um, amazing it's how very much very powerful. It's just amazing how much pain can be calmed or healed by belonging. Absolutely. It is our core need. I feel it is our core need is belonging and it's That's so very yeah. it's just the magic of the internet you know you were saying two sides of the same coin you know the internet mm -hmm. can tear you down but so many people who feel other have found connections you know maybe for the first time in some ways through the internet and i love that horsepower can be a place for people to have face-to-face -face, real life interactions without a screen <laughs> without you know, being on the keyboard, um, but, you know, our students very oftentimes become volunteers. Sometimes our volunteers become students. We have a scholarship program. It's really, um, the whole concept really is to meet people where they're at, demonstrate acceptance and joy, um, demonstrate uh, that we're just, we're better together. You know, we're better together. You don't have to meet your struggles alone. You can there are other people who will help you be excited about your own life. And you know that you have definitely created something bigger than yourself when it can survive you. Oh, yeah. And you're just handing yeah, yeah. it over to these people and they're just keeping it going. It's yeah. amazing to see that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's not unlike parenting, you know, how you're so intensely proud of your adult children when they do well. Um, we built Horsepower as a team. You know, I had a board of directors. I had volunteers. Um, 
the best staff and, you know, we really were a wonderful team. And if you truly have a team, you know, that leader can pass on that template and, you know, be on hand to support as needed if, if, if people need advice, but it's theirs to run with now. And, and I go in and I groom and tackle horse and lead it for a lesson. And, you know, uh, very oftentimes I'm leading a horse in a lesson in a volunteer capacity. And the instructor is my intern who started with me when she was 14 years old. And so now I am serving her in her lesson. It's kind of hilarious and beautiful. Um, it's beautiful because it's, it's like when you planted a tree and you nurtured it and watched it grow and become yeah. mature and bear fruit and you get to do that with a person. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You can sit in the shade. <laughs> I'm sitting in the shade a little bit of this tree because, you know, Max, I was that, you know, being the director at Horsepower was easily 60, sometimes 70 hours a week. I was all in and we did restructure things so that the next person had a little more balance in, in her life. Um, but I could not conceive of just folding Max into that. You know, he's not, he's not an iPad kid, nor do I ever want him to be, you know, um, he's a doer, he's a worker, he's extremely social and also connected, you know, to go back to what we were talking about. And so helping Max to build a new community after public school, I knew how important that would be for him. He was devastated. The whole year that he was 22, he would, when people would ask how old he was, he would tell them he was 21 because it was devastating for him that when he turned 22, he had to leave his program, you know? So we have since that time discovered new programs, you know, he's participating in Rising Lights, which is um, community integration. So they have a really cool gardening program. Um, he's working two days a week at Valley Sheltered Workshop. He attends a recreation uh, program through Fox Valley Special Rec one day a week. So I feel like in a lot of ways, I am his scheduler, his chauffeur, and just his, you know, his biggest supporter. And it just, it feels right. It feels right. Thank goodness you're there to coordinate all this stuff. Well, yes, it, it's really the downfall of the of the state of social services, you know, in that in that individuals with disabilities do not have a continuum of life kind of plan for them. I, I don't know what what other parents are doing that could not step away from their jobs. Most people cannot cannot do that yeah. or will not do that. You know, if they're willing, they're not capable without selling a home or, you know, something really drastic. Um, and as a lot of parents that I've met over the years just feel so beaten down by the system and yeah. their own their own child's frustration with their yeah. lack of progress and the the parent feels like a failure. Yeah. And they kind of give up after a while. And so it's sad to see that when if there was somebody in the system that could just take their hand and say, I've got you. But yeah, that doesn't happen, doesn't, right? Yeah, the system no. doesn't invest in all that. No, no, no. I remember when Max was really little, like his first year of life. You know, I, the denial is a is a powerful thing, and I'm an extremely um, rose colored glasses, very positive person. Sometimes to the point of being a little naive or not seeing the things I need to see. And I it just it sort of lived in me that well, okay, well, you know, if if he really isn't hitting these milestones, and if there's really something concerning and wrong I'll just go to the doctor and everything will you know people will help him and that is not the case that is not the case you go and then you realize oh it's a six-week wait for this it's a 12-week wait for that the state of Illinois only approved about an hour a week of therapy for him and by the time I was done advocating for him we had eight hours a week and from then on you know being Max's advocate for his care has been a just a central part of my life. Without Max, there would have been no horsepower. And um, you know, he deserves that. He deserves someone to advocate for him inside of our home and outside of our home. And I'm not sending him anywhere that I don't, that doesn't pass the vibe check, that doesn't have great references. And he's a nonverbal adult. He's extremely vulnerable. And um, like I said, horsepower was my whole personality for a decade. And sometimes that's what special needs parenting requires at times is completely upending your own life, knowing that your adult child is vulnerable and um, 
you know, his happiness, you know, that saying you're only as happy as your least happy child. You I haven't heard, that, heard that, but it makes sense. Yeah. I used to have found it to be true. Not that your whole identity has to be, you know, how your children are doing, but as a parent, it's really difficult to have a level of happiness yourself, you know, when, when your kid is struggling, you know, and I knew he would struggle. He was already struggling before he graduated. So anyway, anyway, so um, it's, it feels really good and right for things to revolve around him for a while. And then two months into that retirement, we started a new business, the entrepreneur that I am, we started a new business and um, we're running a doggy daycare and boarding business from our home and training. And, and it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Oh, you and I got to <laughs> talk after this. I had no happy idea to. you were doing that. Happy to, happy to. Yeah. A couple months in, I was having friends over, you know, as you do. And they would bring their dogs because we live in the country and have a large fenced yard. And they were saying, oh my gosh, I'm sending all this money with dog daycare. And it's this very artificial kind of astroturf gymnasium situation. So you should start a dog daycare. And, you know, me being me two weeks later, okay, let's do it. And so Max is really involved in helping to, he's the best puppy walker you ever had. We, we sometimes take puppies in for board and train and you know, kind of send puppies home, potty trained and crate trained and kind of, you know, ready for people who have a busy life. Anyway, he's he's a tremendous help. And he also, um, he gives to them and they give to him with when he's feeling, um, you know, when he's feeling a little lonely or if he's feeling um, like he wants some connection, you know, he knows to go sit on a dog bed and see who comes. Somebody always comes. <laughs> but One that has been... Because I got to tell you, as, as part of my neurodivergence, I get depressive episodes. Mm -hmm. And the animals in our house know that. Oh, they do. And they'll find me and I'll get smothered in kisses or they'll lay down and press yeah. up against my side really hard. And yeah. I just start petting them and I start calming down and balancing yeah. out. And I, I imagine the yeah. horses do something similar. Am, am I? For sure. For sure. Horses are the, the horse dog dichotomy is very different. A horse is a herd animal and they're built because other animals have preyed on them, which makes them extremely sensitive. They can detect your heartbeat, your heart rate. So if your heart and is racing that, and you're nervous, like 12 yeah. feet away, they can sense it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And dogs being the hunter, you know, their sense of smell is incredible and they can smell um, they can smell if, if there's a different scent that you make, if your blood sugar is low, there's a different scent that your body makes like a pheromone kind of a thing. If you're going to have a seizure, um, or just, I have to believe if you're just That's sad, you know, like right now, you know, I mean, I'm not nervous doing this, but I'm aware, you know, that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on right. And right now, where are my two dogs? One is on the left and one is on the right, on the front porch, right? They, they know like, oh, something's, mom's doing something, you know, mom's, she's engaged in something. Let's, let's hang out here. They're fantastic and nobody is going to love you like your dog. <laughs> yeah, oh, but it feels really fantastic to help people with their dogs. Um, Max has had two service dogs over the years and that's extensive training that we go through in order to become the handlers for his service dogs. Um, it's just something I naturally love. I love training dogs. I love helping them to be, you know, cooperative members of the family and not barking at everything and not demand, demanding everything of you, but, you know, teaching them how to be confident and chill and helping people with their dogs. Um, I, I think I'll toot my own horn and say, I, I believe there's been at least two dogs that we have saved from being relinquished because their families, you know, their couches were being eaten. <laughs> their kids were getting scratched. Um, so we know how important animals are in our lives. And yet if you're at a loss to manage your dog, what a heartbreak that is. So that feels great. You know, I just, I think I'm built to help people and I really enjoy this new endeavor, which is, you know, helping the dogs and helping people with their dogs. I have some dogs who come here every single day for daycare and training their owners, you know, they have big jobs. They're gone 10 hours a day and they couldn't quite connect well, that, that's why your dog's eating your couch. <laughs> it's just so incredible 
to listen to how you put your values into action. Oh, thank you. I, I think is, it's really difficult to be happy if we're not living our values, you know? It's amazing how many people don't. No, the world tells you not to. The world tells you to punch in your time clock and do this job that maybe you don't love, uh, but, you know, you have this degree and so you have to, sorry, beast. <laughs> you know, the world doesn't really tell you oftentimes to seek right. To seek what your heart's desire is, you know, and I mean, I, wanna offend, I right? applied to college. I was an econ major. <laughs> I was an economics major. And I worked one summer at the convalescent center where my mother worked in the recreation department and said, what am I even doing? I don't care about money. I don't care about finances. I don't, I am not passionate. Like just because I did well in an economic class in high school doesn't mean like that doesn't fire me up. What fires me up is helping yeah. people improve their lives, you know, whether that's by helping them train their dog or teaching their, their kid with cerebral palsy, how to sit up straight on a horse or whether, you know, it's, um, you know, training dogs and, and doing daycare. And it's just, it's so joyful for me. It's very joyful for me to, you know, what's more fun than to see six dogs running and playing and being cared for. And Good not stuff. on my lap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They can also be in my lap, but you know, they're confident they're out there playing. Like I have, um, I I have eight dogs at my house right now and you don't hear them because don't they're tell my wife that. <laughs> well, I only own two. Okay. The other six are paid customers. No, my two. Yeah. I, I I'm limited to two. Oh, that makes me feel better. Cause if you no, heard absolutely. something, I'll run it off. She'd be like, can you introduce us? <laughs> no, no, I would be divorced if I had eight dogs here full time. No, six yeah. of them pay their own way, but it's not an unusual thing. To, I mean, I certainly have a cap on how many I have, but um, I don't know. It's fun. It's fun. It's, it, are... it helps to pay the bills. It helps to allow us to still go on vacations and to still, you know, put money in our retirement and it, you know, I'm all about fiscal responsibility, but not at the expense of your soul, for gosh sakes, you know, doing some soulless job. Are you um, talking about work-life balance? What does I, that? Yeah, I, I don't do have, that? yeah, I, I'm I'm truly not good at that. I'm good at choosing work that inspires me, that I feel motivated to get up and do every day. I, you know, I don't feel sad or that Sunday night dread people have, but I'm, I am, fairly terrible at the balance because clearly like, you know, I'm boarding dogs for a living. So it's 24 hours a day. I'm good at not doing, I'm good at saying no. I'm very good at not doing things that I don't want to do. Um, but the things I do want to do, the things you say yes to can take you down too. So, you know, just trying to keep some moderation to how enthusiastic I can be about yeah. things. When you, know you say I mean? yes, manage expectations. Mm -hmm. Be very clear of what you're saying yes yeah. to because that person can just pull you down a rabbit hole before you know. Yeah. You know, for me, that um, that funnel was always about people pleasing and needing people to think that I'm competent, needing people to admire me, needing people to think I have my shit together, needing people to think I'm a great mom and a um, and the older I get, the more I'm laying that down, you know, that I really, I need to feed my inner voice. And I, I, I know, I know what's right for me and to stop seeking the approval of other people, of any other people, including your parents, your children, your spouse. I have a pretty good internal compass. Um, Carrie's voice is, is pretty good. You know, not that, not that you don't take feedback from your friends and family, but, but that, addictive perpetual seeking of of approval yeah. is a attaching a dopamine your, hit too attaching your self-worth to the approval of others it's a dangerous and thing breaking that bond and learning that my self approval yeah. my worth that's up to me yeah. there's no input from anyone else ever ever necessary yeah, it's a tough one, and I'm just continuing to learn it every day because I am wired that way. We were we were raised we were raised to have a voice, but we were also raised to never let anyone down, to be ultra responsible, 
um, to set a high bar for ourselves and you can make yourself really unhappy striving in that way all the time, especially when what you might be striving for is the approval of others, because that gives a, it really does give your power away. Um, I'm doing, did I tell you about this? Doing a seclusion retreat. Have you ever heard of this? No, because it have... would be terrifying me. <laughs> the response I'm getting from people is very interesting, but yeah, in the, in the, you know, somewhat near future, I'm taking a seclusion retreat and I've been thinking about doing like a silence yoga retreat, maybe, or like a spa retreat. I've been thinking about this for probably five, six years. Is this the one and where I, everybody's there, but nobody talks? That's what I was thinking it would be, which felt, it just didn't feel right. So I've never done it. I have never done it, but I had dinner with a friend and she had taken a while to get back to me to set up the date. And it was because she was on a seclusion retreat. I was like, Ooh, tell me about this. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's run by, it's run by kind of a, a Christian organization, but it's certainly non-denominational. Everyone is welcome. And they have a number of cabins and the cabins are at the end of a trail. And at the top of the trail, it says, do not disturb. So you're really there by yourself. It's not so much a, like you're in the presence of people, but you're silent. You're there to, to be secluded from the world, to be alone, to walk in nature. There's uh, walking paths and ponds and nature. There's a screened in porch. You have your own small little cabin. Um, I do that. Right? Right? Yeah. Like you're not in a city by yourself. You're not like taking mass transit by yourself or like going sightseeing. You're really there to be alone, to stop, you know, the voices in your head. Oh, what does this person need? What does that person need? Um, so I'm going uh, the shiny objects. So you have an opportunity to introspect. Right. Right. You know, maybe take a little bit of a break from, from technology. And like, I'm not going to stick my phone in a drawer and, you know, not, I mean, you could make it whatever you want it to be, but for me, but for me, it just to take a break from serving other people all the time. Um, and to just be alone with my thoughts for a little bit. I'm very good at distracting myself from my own thoughts. I always have an audio book in or a podcast. I'm always keeping my brain very busy. So it will be a nice experiment for me to, you know, take a yoga mat and one dog and uh, go on a seclusion retreat. And you, you can make your own meals. You can certainly leave and go to dinner if you want to, you know. And there's a fire pit area and a lodge, like if you want to sit and be social those are the places to go if someone else wants to be social, but I don't think I will. I don't think I'm going to be interested in idle chit chat with strangers. I really would love to be alone. I'm going to do some painting, some reading, downloaded some movies. When are you doing this? Uh, soon, soon. Well, I cannot wait to hear the report. <laughs> I'll report back. This is very intriguing. I'll let you know. I mean, it is a little scary though, you know, as a woman to go into the world on your own, right? In nature and, and, um, you know, to not be in your familiar setting, but I'm going to risk it. I'm going to risk it. I'm going to go do it. Get yourself a little can of camouflage pepper spray. You know? Oh yeah. I've got the pepper spray. I got the door alarm. I'm bringing my dog who's very protective. You know, I'm not being silly about it, but, um, yeah, my friend who has already been, she says she's done this about three times in the past five years. And, um, that she finds it very centering. It brings her back to herself. It quiets all of the the uh, the voices in her head, telling her, you know, that she has to serve other people all the. And by serve other people, I mean we. I want to take care of people in my life. You know, I I enjoy doing that. I want to do that. But again, the things we enjoy, it can become too much, right? It just can become a it little bit have too, too much. Too much of a good yeah. thing, yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, and I have such a supportive husband. He's like, "Well, that sounds nuts, but I bet you'll love it. You should go do that." <laughs> so he oh, takes that's time an off work. Statement. Oh yeah, we're that very honest nuts, with one another. I bet you'll love it. Yeah, love yeah, yeah. We've been together since 1988. <laughs> we speak the truth. Right. Like, well, that sounds crazy, but go for that's it. That's what I graduated. Yeah, yeah. We met cool. um, one year after I was out of high school, and you know, he's very. Um, He's very supportive in my various endeavors. Um, he's supportive that that uh, you know if if I if I'm saying that you know a seclusion retreat sounds like what I need, he's like, oh, it must be what you need. 
enjoy. I'm going to take some time off work. Max and I are going to go do this, that, and the other. Um, and gosh, most people just don't have that men or women. Most people just don't have someone who has their back in that way, you know, man, isn't so, that the truth? Too many couples know. compete with each other. Well, we have also had, we can also have that as well. Who's the most tired? <laughs> Who's had the hardest oh day? You know, it's, well, it's a silly too. routine, but yeah. 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 Man. You know, it's marriage is, um, my oldest son recently became engaged. And so we've been doing wedding planning and it was really funny. We we're doing a little venue road trip with her mom and myself and, you know, all of the, you know, you can't help but give people advice, whether they want it or not. You can't help but give them sage wisdom. And it's just that marriage is, it's not rainbows and unicorns and, you know, happily ever after. It is a long compromise. You know, it's a long compromise of sometimes you put yourself first, sometimes you put the other person first. And, and then, you know, a 30 plus year marriage, we're different people. We have been many different people in the context of this marriage. I am not the person I was in 1988, you know, and neither is he. And we need to give one another permission to evolve and change and have different needs. And, you know, this might be my season to focus on work and that might be your season. Um, but it's hard to navigate. It's hard to be kind to people that you know will, that you feel will always be there for you. It's hard to not take people for granted. And, any chance you've got a book in the works? No. <laughs> no, who knows? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, maybe I should bring a journal to my seclusion retreat. Well, it, well if you, you decide you want to write one, I've totally got your back. Well, that is such a nice compliment. Thank you. No, I've never yeah. thought about writing a book. <laughs> well, something but I to love ponder. to read and I love to read. I love to read a good autobiography. And by read, I mean, listen, I'm an audiobook only girl. Um, I love, I love, love, love to read a good audio book. Um, just read Kamala Harris's book, which is partly autobiographical and partly, you know, her, um, what her political aspirations and, um, her accomplishments have been. I, I believe it was written in 2018, but, oh, I, I love an autobiography read to me by the author. It's nothing better. <laughs> That's even more powerful. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I could talk to you all day. Thank and you. I'm so glad we caught up just to hear about what drives you and what you're up to and where you're going and how you're well, still motivated you. to do things. That's fantastic to hear. And please well, send me the information on your doggy daycare. Oh, I will. I'll send you info on that. I'll send you info on the seclusion retreat. And, you know, it's really the highest compliment to be invited to you know, sit and have a conversation with someone that I respect. Um, you have such a plethora of knowledge and empathy and understanding about people and how to help people who have differences. Um, so that someone I respect is, is even interested in what I'm doing with my life over here. It's the highest compliment. So thank you very much for that. It's very meaningful to me. I am absolutely honored. And I will let everybody else go for now. And I'm going to get that information from Carrie. So you got it. You got everybody. it. Everybody. And thank you I so much. I will respond immediately. <laughs> thank you.